Thanks to Yuan, I got an introduction to Docker today. Uh, when I came here, I had no idea what I actually want to do with Docker. You know, Docker to me is like an overhyped thing, right? Because what it is, is it sets up a process on your computer to be prisoned so much that it looks like kind of a virtual thing, even though it's, it's not. I see the application, it makes total sense. It wasn't there before, it's efficient, it's cool. But to me, you know, I, I, had, I didn't know what to, what to do with that. Um, today I learned that actually using Docker, and that's a big part of Docker's success, using Docker is quite easy. So I realized I want to use Docker for my own project as well. So that project, that's the first five minutes of this talk, by the way, is Google APIs for Rust. The second part will be about how this project now <laughs> uses Docker to, well, add value to it, right? And that's just a step one that I have in mind. So Rust is this new awesome programming language that is as fast as C or C++ but provides built-in safety. And this built-in safety part is something huge. You know, you change the way you, you're programming, basically, uh, without sacrificing anything else. You know, you have full control over every, every, anything that there is. And it changed, it really changed my life. Rust is kind of a, a milestone in my life in, and in my career, I think, because I don't really know what else I want to program anymore. That is my new favorite language, that's clear. So in order to apply that language to something uh, a little more practical, I decided that I want to do a project that makes sense to me. So uh, what makes sense to me? You know, I'm, I kind of started to get into the YouTube thing, so I really like to do YouTube videos about anything. And I have a whopping 68 subscribers already, and every single one was hard-earned, you know, because it's kind of special stuff that I do with lots of programming in there, and, you know, not many people are actually interested in that. But that doesn't matter. The fact is that um, everything I do uh, during the day, I will record and upload to YouTube. So I'm talking the entire day, basically, with the Internet and have some sort of, you know, extreme programming going on there. But that requires me to upload a lot of things every day. And I have a very small bandwidth, just one Mbit upload speed. And this means that basically my bandwidth, my upstream is used 24 hours a day. Because if I work eight, nine hours a day and record this um, with the quality that I chose, I definitely need 40, uh, 24 hours to upload this. So it's really like full usage of my bandwidth. And I'm fine with that, you know, I, I don't mind the delay. Um, this also means that whenever I do an upload like this, which is five gigabyte, you know, when I cut stuff, it's getting really large. But in any case, when I upload something, it must be going up there, right? And uh, that motivated me to have a YouTube uploader. I wanted to have a YouTube uploader that is bulletproof. You know, if your network fails, if you have to reboot your computer, you should be able to still resume your upload and you shouldn't have to take care of it at all. Right now, this is not possible with the, with the browser-based thing and it's based on your browser. Sometimes you have to, have to update your Chrome, which right now I don't, fortunately, and then you can't do it. You know? you're, you're risking your security because your upload is um, in danger otherwise. So that shouldn't be. Uh, therefore, I thought, good, let's write a YouTube loader for or in Rust. And to write a YouTube uploader, I'm kind of bringing the motivation of that project to you first. Um, and to write such a YouTube uploader, uh, you will need an API to Google YouTube. The cool thing is YouTube itself, uh, YouTube API, uh, provides everything you want, uh, as well as resumable downloads. Resumable downloads is something that is provided by default for um, YouTube which is awesome, but it's not really supported by the tools that you currently have available. And I want to have such a tool that makes that available, and I want it to be on the command line, because command line is kind of what I use all day long. Well, not all day long, but it's, it's a major tool for me, right? These two, uh, well, these three actually are the major tools and the shell I want to use to do my uploads, because it allows me to automate stuff and really upgrade my workflow there. But of course, for Rust, nothing really exists. There are lots of um, 
there are lots of APIs available already um, for different programming languages, for instance, for Go. So you can, with Go, interface with 78 uh, different APIs or services, basically, that Google provides, but in Rust, you don't have that. So I was thinking, let's implement YouTube, right? YouTube v3, let's do that. And let's just do it by hand, right? I just need a few functions there, like insert a video or something, and that should be, should be it. But in fact, we are talking about a massive undertaking. I'm, I'm still scrolling here. I think I will end at 11,000 lines of something that resembles Go code. And as you can see, all this is very, very, you know, it's a quite a big thing to do, and I ended up generating all these, I ended up writing a generator that generates Rust code. Uh, by now, I am actually in that project generating all the Google APIs there are from the latest um, revision that there is, because I'm pulling this from their discovery service as well, uh, generating 800,000 lines of code, of which there are source code 524,000 lines and comment lines 228,000 lines. So that's the project here uh, for Rust. And uh, Rust is a programming language, a language that compiles to the machine, right? So you have to compile it basically in all the platforms that you want to use the command for. Um, speaking of which, um, this is an API, right? It's a library. You link to that in your program, but what is that program? If you want to use this thing that is Google APIs for Rust, you need something. You need a command line program, and that's also included in this project. So what you can do now is um, basically make um, make an API that you like. Actually, I've, I've compiled this already uh, to get a binary here. In this case, for the discovery API, there's 2.2 megabyte. It's standalone. It contains everything it needs. And you can just run it and have a, in this case, very small command that you can execute. But this obviously will only run on OS X because I compiled it here. Um, Cross-platform compilation is currently not Rust's strong shoe. If you write something in Go, you can basically use Gox, which I probably don't have installed here now, it's on my development machine. You can use Gox to compile for all platforms supported by, um, by Go, but in Rust that's not possible, so you need virtual machines or something. I've got Parallels, also not here, but in Parallels you could basically just build all the stuff and then deploy or distribute these um, command line interfaces to all the Google APIs. By the way, these command line interfaces, they're very unique because you don't find them. I mean, it's the first time somebody does this, actually, to generate command line interfaces to all the Google APIs. Speaking of Drive, YouTube, um, Maps, whatever, you can control it from your command line from now on uh, once this is released. So my problem is, how do I compile this stuff for Linux, for different uh, distributions even, for OS X, for Windows? How do I do that? And with Docker, and now I'm finally getting to the point here, I hope I don't use more than five minutes, probably I did. Um, now with Docker, I at least have a solution to build on Linux distributions, right? Because now I can compile for Debian, for Fedora, and I know it will work uh, using Docker. So how do I do this? You know, I'm a Docker beginner, obviously, because that's the first time I actually uh, started this. So uh, there are two parts to this, right? As far as, you know, what I learned today is the following. First, Docker files. So I've got a new, I've made a new repository actually on GitHub that is, uh, I hope I do see it here right away, which is Docker files, that one. So yeah, I've, I've just, I didn't push anything to this yet, but what you'll find in here is Docker files for all kinds of purposes, also for the Rust uh, build environment. So in order to build anything with Rust, uh, you will want some um, setup that brings you a Linux with the Rust compiler, and in this case, this is the latest Rust there is. So this is Rust Nightly, right? The, the kind of alpha version of Rust. Um, that's pretty cool. But I need additional things because I am generating code. I will need uh, Make, and I also need Python because the generator is written, written in Python. And um, what I'm doing is basically, I say, give me the latest, greatest Rust compiler here. And whatever that means, I don't care. I just say from Schickling Rust. 
And then I just add my bits and pieces, right? That's the delta I'm adding. So I'm just adding, uh, setting up a few commands here that will uh, set up this um, image. And I think just talking about it is no fun. This is too small. Just talking about it is no fun. Let's do it. And it's too far down, I think. So let's bring it up. There we go. Um, this is my Docker image here, and I usually have a make file for everything because I don't want to bother with the actual invocation. So I, I want to make an image here, which will generate this Docker image and save it under the right name. And because I think I have this image created already, which is this, I shall Docker RMI remove image this guy. And it didn't work because the container is using it. What do I do now? How can I kick this? Oh, it's running, you mean? Okay. Because container, this one, is using it. Docker kill. Okay, I didn't even know. <laughs> uh, so now I should be able to... All right. Whatever that means. So now we are on the in demo mode, which is not trained. But then? Yeah, so nothing is running, so that's great. I just want to have a clear slate here. Obviously, if this would be prepared, we wouldn't do this. So I say make image to get this build environment. For me, it's nothing that runs permanently. For me, it's something that is something I kick in when I want it, then the compiler runs, produces all. Um, the output that I require from the source I currently have. And while this guy is working, you know, it's executing all these things, it's actually done already. I just want to go away and show you how this is used. So now we have this image, um, Docker images sh shall show it. I have it locally already, which is all I need, you know. This push-pull workflow is not relevant to this demo. Um, so that's that, you know, in my, my separate repository, um, I just keep the Docker images or the Docker definition files that I need to build these images. Some, some side note that I want to make at this point. You really want to have these Docker files in a separate repository because when you build it, you have to say, here, Docker build from the current directory. And this dot sends the contents of the current directory to the Docker daemon and will make it available and some stuff like that. And this is something you don't want in your project, right? Because it will pick up all stuff that is not relevant for, for my particular case. Just for my case, I'm just saying. So this picks up everything in this current directory and I don't, want, I don't really want anything in there. So now that we have the image, I shall go to my Google API project, um, which is here, where I have another make file. You know, that's just a general idea of mine. Uh, Everything you do, everything you have must be self-documenting. It's not for others, it's for yourself because you in two months will not know how to operate this system anymore. So it must be really easy to use. Anyway, um, make Wheezy build. That's something I added today and we, we are going to have a look at this because that's kind of the second part of this whole project integration that I have so far. And I really just hacked it in. I didn't even commit yet, as you see, because I'm not totally satisfied with how I did it. But that's kind of the general idea anyway. So what I say is, I have an output directory that is right now, uh, uh, that is right now directly in my, uh, in my project root. And I just make sure that I kill this directory before I do anything and I set it up. And now the actual Docker invocation. It's not too simple to run Docker correctly because you have to you need to know what kind of what your image wants right i've got a built environment there are certain requirements that i have and i really need to know it the good thing is it's okay the knowledge is encoded in this uh, make file so i'm good with that so um, i want to run this image which will then become a container <laughs> that runs um, and there are a few mappings I do. So for me, the most important thing is the volume mapping, right? Uh, because I want to map my current working directory, which contains all the source code, to this uh, source path on the, in the container. And the, the other mapping is for the output. So I want to say that here, my current working directory, it wants absolute path, by the way. This is why I do this. Personally, I don't care, but this guy says absolute path is the only thing I take, probably for security reasons. 
so here I map the input and the second call is mapping the output. So this output directory I just created locally uh, will be mapped, mapped to build result. Okay, and then this is the name of the, the image here. This is just, um, you know, Russ Byron's Night, Nightly, the one I just created. And um, the next thing I do is to execute this script, right? This script is coming from the source directory that I just mapped. So this script is something I just maintain myself. I just put it into Git and I'm good with that. So it's a simple shell script that kicks in the entire build process. So um, this will build all the 78 command line interfaces right now for testing. I disabled that and just said I just built one. And the output of that, the build result, will be found by this find uh, invocation and then be copied to the build result, which is also mapped to my local directory, right? So if that works, and I thought it did work, I can say wheezy build, and this will kick in Docker, execute the script, and then start the Rust build process. So this is what you see here. And uh, this will, I mean, this machine is not super fast and Rust is quite slow in compiling, especially in release mode. So I executed this beforehand. And if we are good, I should have this build directory here that contains a single file that is discovery. Uh, as you can see, it's empty because I think I never ran this to the, to the end. I always aborted it beforehand, uh, but it doesn't matter. The point is that now I have my virtual environment that doesn't require a virtual machine that runs in theory faster than a virtual machine because it's quite, you know, it's just a process. And I'm telling you it's a process, but what am I saying? Let's have a look at the Rust command that is running. Uh, it's a Docker daemon, huh? Docker, Docker D somewhere. Where is Docker? Yeah, I just want to show you that actually Rust is running on this machine as a sub-process here somewhere, but I'm unable to find it right now. Oh, build failed. Awesome. Oh yeah, okay, good. That explains a lot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is why it's still better, and I know exactly why this fails, but that's kind of the setup that I have. Uh, this allows me to build for, for Linux um, without any overhead. I can just execute my make command. All I need is Docker. It's quite easy to set up. And that's, that's the value that Docker added to my project. In future, and then I'm done, kind of a second stage of my Docker implementation, I think I want to provide a Docker image that contains, that is for deployment. Basically, if you want to try these, command, but don't, these commands, but don't want to install it for Windows, for instance, where there is, where I probably will never build these. And you know, once Docker runs on, on Windows, you can then just pull the Docker image that contains all these command line interfaces um, for your pleasure uh, without having to deal with anything else. So that's second stage, Docker for building and Docker for deployment. I think that's a good application for this, um, you know, and maybe something different that you usually see, which is kind of cloud and server and services and interconnection, that's already, value added to me because I don't have to deal with big virtual machines and things like that. That is it from my point, uh, from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, now is the time. Otherwise, I'm done. Thanks for listening.